people think to say it. If I had my druthers, I wouldn't turn the key and got rid, get rid of it in one day. My position is we should have competition, and competition will take care of it. We can go from a, a, com, a competitive currency with gold and silver against paper and eventually we'll win out. But uh, they're not going to allow a, competitive, a, a competing currency. But the Fed will go, at least under the today's condition, as the, as the dollar will go. And that is what I dread. I think things have been really tough in these last 10 years, really tough in these last two years. And yet, I think the really thing to worry about is a collapse uh, of, of, the, uh, of the dollar. Now, the reason why there's so much support for the Fed and the system of money that we have is that the majority of people in Washington like big government. And the majority of the American people like big government. Because whether you, we had a conservative administration or a liberal administration, they really didn't care about deficit. And nobody really likes to raise taxes to pay all the bills. So therefore, you know, they spend, they get reelected, and everybody's happy, and they borrow here, tax here, then they, they inflate. But that is coming to an end. I think that is what we're hearing, and I think that's what we're hearing from the Tea Party movement, that you just don't go out and brag about all the money you get back from Washington. That's very healthy, that you actually tell the truth and, and say that it's time to cut back. But the real problem with the system we have it has been a seductive way to finance big government, whether it's for the welfare recipients here at home, whether it's for corporate welfare, but also for the military industrial complex and for subsidizing all that we do overseas, which I see as very, very harmful to our economy. We can't spend a trillion dollars, which is now estimated to cost us to run our operations overseas. We can't continue to do that. So I see that coming to an end. Uh, I think the Soviet system was great that they came to their new needs. We didn't have to fight them, yet we were in a cold war with them for a long, long time. So they were brought to their knees, but we can as well. We can do that as well. So I look forward to what's happening right now, and the people are waking up. And to me, that that is the most uh, that is the best news that we have today, because ultimately, what takes care of us is not the way we invest our personal funds. That's very important. Just think how important it is for every individual that has the knowledge to be able to protect, and if the crisis gets much worse, they can take care of themselves. That in itself is very, very valuable. And so it helps more, the more people that know about it, the easier it is to pick up the people. But ultimately, that is not it. You know, there's no secrecy anymore, and there's going to be more and more invasion of our privacy. Now, today, if they want to look at a satellite picture, they can tell you how many cars are in your, your, your driveway. So it's not easy to escape the hound dogs, no matter going around the world or elsewhere. They will, they will send the satellites and take their pictures, and now they can control, they can control weapon systems uh, from the states and hit any spot in the world. So the investment I call for is the investment in liberty. The investment in liberty because time and energy and money. It's not because you feel uh, generous but out of self-interest. We must invest to protect liberty and protect our rule of law. And if we did that, we would have some tough economic times, but it wouldn't take long. In a year or so after the correction, we'd all be back on our feet again, and we could restore prosperity, which then would be permanent. And I think that's approximately 15 minutes, so I, I will go ahead and pause there and see if we uh, can, can get some questions. Anybody have any questions? Okay, here's the first one I see here. You, you have been quoted as saying you wouldn't disband the IRS. You would disband the IRS and the Fed. How would you then raise money to run the government? You know, I get that, I get that question a whole lot. And I would say, well, how did we run our government before 1913? You know, we didn't have the Fed to print the money, and we didn't have the IRS to collect our taxes. Um, I, I wouldn't replace it. They say, what, what are you going to replace it with, a sales tax or, or whatever? No. I would only replace it by having constitutional government. Get rid of the welfare state and, re and bring our troops home and don't have a warfare state. Don't support the military industrial complex. But if you get rid of the income tax and you get rid of taxes and you believe we can still run the world with a world empire and have endless prosperity by just bailing out everybody. Everybody has a need just go to Washington, as we are doing. And as the states fail, we're going to bail out everybody. But that will end. So I would say you do not need an income tax if you have a government that is proper sized. Okay, I do. 
don't see another question as of now. How would you? If uh, under those circumstances, if you do have to raise money, initially in our history, what happened uh, was they had uh, they had franchise taxes and some import taxes, uh, but they were they were rather minimal. So it is the uh, role of government uh, that really counts. And I want to make mention that uh, my questions are not coming up and my clock is not working, so if I have to stop or go over, uh, but uh, if somebody can give me a question or I'll think up something else to say if you want me to, <laughs> because I could talk about Basel III or something like that if we uh, don't have a particular question. Matter of fact, I will, until I see another question, I think what I might do is uh, what I might do is talk a little bit about Basel III because they are meeting there right now. Matter of fact, that meeting might have resolved, uh, have ended. Uh, I don't expect anything to come out of that meeting in, in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, there may be some announcement that might move markets, but I think it's really irrelevant long term. They're going to talk about capital uh, standards and reserve standards and, and who's going to get stuck with Can we reopen this? all the... these meetings is that the, uh, the those individuals participating there, what they're doing in the back room is probably much more important than you'll ever hear about because I think they know a lot about we what we know and worry about uh, about our currency and inflation and, and, and the seriousness of our problem. So I am, uh, I am confident that they are talking about and already uh, thinking about another world currency because they're not going to pass my bill and legalize competing uh, standards. The one thing Basel III will not consider is they won't consider the uh, principle of the lender of last resort, which is what our Fed is supposed to do, that is print money and anybody needs it. And uh, also, uh, it will not be challenging and, and, and questioning the principle of fractional reserve banking. They won't challenge the whole principle of fiat money. They won't challenge the idea of government insurance and guarantee that all these mistakes. All they're going to do is talk about regulating because they're not going to have another crisis. They think they can offer this seriously flawed monetary system that is going to always generate bubbles and think, oh, if we just had sophisticated regulations, we're going to prevent uh, all those problems. Now, I, I think I have another question here. It says, with interest rates near zero, uh, marking a turning point in bond yields uh, from a peak in 1971 when capital flows from U.S. and well, I'm not sure I see the end of the question. <laughs> so. Well, okay. I think I might guess what he's asking about. Be able to have a shoot. Okay, he was um, bringing up the subject of very low interest rates and. Uh, of course, when uh, Bernanke and others come to the committee, the banking committee, I frequently bring this up because, uh, of course, low interest rates of 0% aren't market. I mean, this is all fix price fixing by the Federal Reserve, believing that they can solve the problems in the economy by having interest rates at 1%. And everybody's going to say, oh, great, I'm going to go out and build more houses. In Washington, they want low interest rates and they want to stimulate housing when we have millions of houses that are unsold. So they're doing exactly the wrong thing. But what I challenge them on the manipulation of interest rates is, and last time Bernanke was before the committee, I tried to bring up the moral issue because he wasn't interested in my economic or constitutional arguments. But by what right does he have to set interest rates for a CD at 1% uh, for somebody who is frugal, saves their money, and they want to uh, take care of themselves? And yet if we had a market rate of interest, they might be making 6%. Oh, well, that's different, you know, sort of the price they have to pay. But to me, it's bad economics and it's bad constitutional law. It's bad morality because the interest rates are very low. But they keep buying these treasury bills at, uh, when they're earning essentially no interest. But just think, nobody would buy treasury bills when they were earning 15% in 1980. So, uh, but that'll change. It'll change if... If, if it doesn't change, that means they have canceled out the laws of nature, the laws of economics, that you can create something out of nothing, and it just doesn't work. They can be fooled for a long time, but if you print a lot of money, 
uh, eventually the confidence will be lost. And uh, I think we're getting precariously close to that point where that confidence will be lost. Okay. Um, I, let's see. Dr. Dr. Paul. Is, oh, Bob. How high? Uh, how high we can expect gold prices to go? Well, it depends on how how low you expect the dollar to go. And I think the dollars potentially uh, could be defaulted on completely. Uh, it's a possibility. Most likely, they'll stop it and come to their senses. They'll probably save the dollar, but not under current conditions. But if they keep doing what they're doing, which they're going to for a while, and it's not going to change after the next, next election, it's virtually impossible to predict and say, oh, gold is going to, I believe gold is going to be a lot higher. All I know is when I was, uh, you know, very, very impressed uh, on August 15th of, uh, of 1971, uh, gold was $35 an ounce. All I knew is they were going to print a lot of money. So. Uh, slowly over the years, buying gold as it was going up made a lot of sense. But I didn't predict and say, oh, you know, in five years it's going to be such and such. And I didn't know that we would have about 18 or 19 years where the gold price hardly moved. But uh, I think under today's circumstances, we're going to continue to see uh, gold go up. And it's going to, it's going to go up into the thousands of dollars, uh, in my best estimation. You know, I can tell you one quick little story about um, – about going to see Volcker one day, one morning with a private meeting. It was in 1979 when gold was in seven or eight hundred dollars. And when he walked into the meeting, he went to his aide immediately, not to me, to say hello. He went to his aide, and the first thing he says, "What's the price of gold?" So central bankers watch their gold. They know that gold price is a vote against uh, what their job that they're doing, and that is why I believe they're very much in the business of making sure gold prices are lower than the market would be, just like they kept gold at $35 an ounce for a long